what I was tasked to do uh, is to provide an overview of models of neutrino masses and their flavor mixing. Of course, this falls under a bigger problem of the fermion masses and mixing patterns uh, that several of the previous speakers already alluded to. So as we already heard, uh, there have been a wealth of neutrino data coming in. And all this data posted the following two challenges from the theoretical point of view. First of all, uh, how the neutrino masses are so much smaller compared to the charged fermion masses. And secondly, uh, why, their flavors, why, why their mixing are so large as compared to their quark counterpart. So the ultimate goal here is to find a unified understanding, a unified description, so that we can understand the pattern of the elementary fermion masses, uh, this huge disparity that come across some uh, 12 orders of magnitude, as well as a uh, understanding, simultaneous understanding of this drastic difference uh, between the quark and lepton mixing patterns. So why should we care or why should you care? First of all, uh, we heard that there's a, this wealth of data coming in from the experimental side and from the talk by Michael, uh, Pedro and Alex, we know theory plays an extremely important role in order to understand and interpret this data. Uh, secondly, if you really think about it, so far we only understand a very small part of the standard model parameters. Uh, specifically, what I meant is the gauge sector. Uh, this pattern of masses and mixing that I show you, within the standard model, uh, this, these patterns are accommodated by a relatively large number of parameters in the Yukawa sector. So what that means is, so far we only uh, understand you know, a very small part, uh, four out of the 25-ish parameters within the standard model. And a significant fraction of them, we still don't have any idea why their structure is what we observe. Uh, as we were here uh, from Zora, neutrinos also serve as a very unique window into the BSM physics. So far, we don't have any understanding of what neutrino mass generation mechanism is. And given the uniqueness of the neutrino masses, in particular, because they are neutral, uh, this offer uh, a lot of possible connections uh, to new physics frameworks, right? But I think the most important point that I hope to get across is that by studying neutrinos, actually this affords many opportunities for new explorations. Uh, in particular, there have been some recent developments on the tools uh, that are actually very exciting uh, new opportunities for model buildings. And I uh, re re recall that there, are, there have been quite a few questions asking about uh, the final relevance of formal theories. And I hope here uh, we'll see a couple of tools that you know, may be familiar uh, to some of, of our former colleagues. These new tools may address other puzzles in particle physics beyond neutrino sector and they may also provide window into early universe. And given that some of these tools may appear in string theories, you know, through the flavor portal, this may also offer a way uh, to connect string theories with the real world. All right, so for Majorana neutrinos, uh, if neutrinos are Majorana particles, what we already told us that at dimension five, their masses can be generated and given that this is a unique dimension five operator, this is the most sensitive place uh, to look for new physics. Depends on the portals that, uh, that, that UV complete, the Weber operators, we have a three type of CISO mechanism. Uh, for type one CISO, this can be naturally embedded into grand unified theory, uh, where for low energy CISO scale, these realizations are also possible. So this for under type two, type three, and various type of, uh, you know, uh, alternate seasonal mechanisms that can realize Majorana neutrino masses. Of course, we go beyond uh, dimension five. Uh, 
at even higher dimensions, uh, neutrino Majorana well, neutrino masses can be generated, and this uh, can significantly lower the cutoff scale, uh, which offer the opportunities to probe neutrino mass at the collider experiments. What if neutrino are direct? All right, so this is actually pretty exciting, and I think there have not been enough emphasis uh, paid uh, to this scenario. But the bottom line is, the scenarios that have been proposed all are you know, closely related to solutions to the gauge hierarchy problems. So for example, in the warp extra dimensions, due to the small overlap, we can naturally accommodate uh, small Dirac masses to the neutrinos. A small direct neutrino masses can be generated through uh, the loop radiated radiatively. Uh, in the clockwork scenario, uh, due to the large number of sites, this again offer another mechanism to suppress the neutrino masses. Uh, so Susie breaking, again, this is very similar to the uh, Judy chain mass inner mechanism. Neutrino masses can also be suppressed. All right, coming to flavor, um, one approach is to say, well, uh, there's no parametrically small numbers in the large mixing angles, the near degeneracy that we observe are just some statistical consequence. So this is for under the name of anarchy. But even though uh, this is rather random, actually several UV theory predictions can resemble anarchy. So one such uh, framework is the work extra dimension. Another example is the heteroxy models, uh, which typically predict some order of 100 Rahindi neutrinos. And given this large number of Rahindi neutrinos, you need to sum over some older 100 diagrams. And therefore, this actually provides a way to explain that uh, you know, two order of magnitude discrepancy between the usual CISO map, uh, CISO scale, which is around 10 to the 14 GeV, as well as a gas scale, which is 10 to the 16 GeV, right? So on the right here, which I plotted, or I took the result from this paper where they do a statistical study by increasing the number of right-handed neutrinos. And as you can see, when we get to a large number, uh, here the predictions are large for the mixing parameters. All right. But another approach is to say, well, the observed mixing patterns actually are due to some underlying dynamics, uh, such as uh, underlying flavor symmetries, which distinguish the three generations. So the observed large mixing actually motivate a lot of activity recently uh, on constructing models based on non-abelian discrete uh, flavor symmetries. So here, this is a nice exhaustive list of uh, the discrete non-abelian groups that have been uh, um, utilized. And basically, the, the, the structure of the model is such that you have some symmetry breaking pattern in the charged electron sector, the other in the neutrino sector. And due to the mismatch of these two symmetry breaking patterns, that result in the observed PMLS matrix. All right. But since through this you know, process of studying the non-abelian discrete symmetries, I think one of the recent developments, which is quite exciting, is the fact that there exists a new origin uh, for CP violation. Uh, and this is pure, purely group theoretical. Um, so this is due to the fact that for a certain non-abelian discrete group, the cost golden coefficients are intrinsically complex, all right? So this leads us to uh, classify all the non-abelian discrete groups into three uh, categories. Uh, one is uh, type one, which are groups that do not have class inverting uh, auto, auto automorphism. And therefore in generic setting here, uh, the group transformation basically clashes with a physical CP transformation. And therefore you cannot define CP, uh, you know, in, in this setup generically. Where there's a type two group, um, in one type there's a CP basis, which allow for all CG coefficient to be real. And the type two B group, uh, there's no basis in which where all CG are real. However, these are the groups that emit a class inverting auto-automorphism and therefore, uh, the sort of 
allow for uh, defining CP invariants, uh, you know, in the model. And all these discrete group, non-Ophelian groups, uh, I think very familiar to some of you, because these may come from, uh, they, they, they may originate uh, from extra dimensions. And uh, this led our European colleagues to propose that instead of considering the flavor symmetries, now we can promote the flavor symmetry to be modular flavor symmetries. So uh, what that means is uh, this is the symmetry uh, symmetry that relate the two different descriptions of equivalent tori. All right. Uh, yes. So this is inspired by string theories. And once we impose the modular invariance, the consequence is that the Yukawa couplings now are given in terms of the modular forms, right? And this turns out to lead to very highly predictive models. All right, so just give you some uh, abstract like how predictive uh, this could be. Uh, let's just consider one way operator, LLHH. Suppose my three generations of lepton doublets transform as a triplet under this A4 uh, group. In the traditional A4 scenario, the Yukawa couplings basically are parameterized by the flavor fields. Uh, so this, uh, this result in a uh, neutrino mass matrix that contains six real parameters, right? But by promoting the A4 symmetry uh, to be a modular A4 symmetry, now the Yukawa coupling constants are given in terms of the modular forms, which contains only two real parameters. So this is a really uh, significant reduction. And turns out, uh, even with this uh, drastic reduction of the parameters, uh, one can get really good fit uh, to the neutrino, uh, neutrino data. Okay, so my time is up. Uh, yes. So of course, uh, this may be familiar to some of you. Uh, modular invariants actually have a lot of relevance, even beyond the neutrino physics. So I talk about the, you know, the bottom up. Uh, doing flavor model building utilizing modular flavor symmetry. From the top down, this is also very relevant in string theories. Uh, but recently, uh, there is also a proposal uh, by, by Keith uh, you, utilizing the modular invariance to regularize, regularize uh, the Higgs mass. And for people working on MP2, uh, you may also be aware that uh, you know, modular invariance is relevant. Uh, through their connection in the Feynman integrals. Okay, so just move to my conclusion slide. Uh, so far, the fundamental origin of fermion masses and mixing pattern is your unknown, and this actually constitutes a big part of the gender model. So we've been trying very hard. This is a hard problem, and I know you know some of our colleagues say, "Well, this is the time to give up, right? Because it's been so long." I just want to remind you, looking back in this history, it took us decades to understand the gauge sector of the cinder model, which constitutes only a small part of the cinder model. Um, the uniqueness of neutrino mass is over exciting opportunities uh, to explore BSM physics. And there have been some uh, recent new tools and insight uh, that are quite exciting uh, and again, these, I think, are good examples of the final relevance of the formal series. Uh, two examples I have discussed include the non-abelian discrete flavor symmetries, as well as the modular flavor symmetries. And lastly, I just want to emphasize, I think, having a diverse perspective, uh, you know, and, and approaches drive intellectual uh, excellence in our fields. So I'll stop here. Thank you. Question. We have a hand. I'm oh, sorry. Yeah, we have a hand from Keith. I've got. We've got a hand from Keith Deans. Keith, you want to unmute yourself and. Uh, Hi. Hi. Uh, thanks, Mitra. Nice talk. Thank you for mentioning my work. But actually, I just want to make it clear: the modular invariance that I'm talking about is not the modular invariance you're talking about. I think you're talking about space-time modular invariance. I'm talking about world sheet. Yes. So I am not using it as a regulator. 
What I was doing in my work with Steve Abel was exploring the consequences of modular invariance for UV IR mixing and for finiteness. It was not being implemented as a means of regulation. It was exploring what string theory naturally gives because world sheet modular invariance is baked into the structure of closed strings. So it's a little bit different, but thanks for the mention anyway. I appreciate it. No, thanks for the clarification. I didn't have time to go into detail. Thank you. Thank you. So, let's bring you in.